The most habitual event to occur every time Wes Anderson releases a new film is the tired discourse found in the film critic section of the internet. The usual suspects come out of the woodwork and repeat the same opinions that were spoken the last time. Wes Anderson is all style. His films are too quirky for their own good. The symmetrical framing is boring and overdone. We've heard it for years, but with Asteroid City, these complaints seem even more fruitless. If anything, Asteroid City is the perfect counter-argument against these complaints. Asteroid City is a film about a photographer and his four children arriving in Asteroid City, a tiny town in the middle of the Nevada desert, where the oldest son is participating in a youth science convention. During a stargazing event, a spaceship comes down, and the crowd becomes unwilling participants in the first contact with life outside Earth. The town is immediately quarantined, and everyone then spends the next week grappling with the existential realization that life is bigger than they thought, as well as deal with the small dramas playing out in their lives. At least that's what the trailers depicted. As it turns out, only half of the story has been advertised to the audience, a new filmic cardinal sin in this world where audience members are inspired to sue production companies for supposedly lying to them in the advertisements. Though I do not believe Asteroid City will be dealt with the same issues as like the film Drive, where a woman sued producers for not delivering her a film more akin to The Fast and the Furious. Everything shown in the trailer is there in the final cut, but what isn't depicted and only hinted at in the film's poster is the framing device of the entire film. Asteroid City is actually a 1950s television program about a play called Asteroid City, written by Conrad Earp, who's played by Edward Norton, and who I assume is loosely based on Tennessee Williams. Brian Cranston hosts the show and delivers context a la Rod Serling. In between each act of the play, we are shown scenes of the play's production struggles and the drama between actors and creators. Each of these scenes adds some wonderful context when we are brought back into the play sections. The different sections are visually represented with the reality being presented in a 4x3 aspect ratio and in black and white. The play is then shown in the colorful widescreen aspect ratio advertised, which I suspect is how Conrad always saw the play in his head, giving the express visual style more cause than any anti-Anderson critic would give credit to. Wes Anderson's screenplay is the best one he has written in quite a long time. It's a film about the art of creating and performing. It's a film about grief and how it affects us, whether it's real or performed. I found the black and white segments to be the most interesting parts of the film. It's a great homage to a time when the notion of performance was being radically changed by the creation of method acting by Lee Strasberg and the group theater a collection of directors and performers who include Elia Kazan, Marlon Brando, and James Dean. Anderson takes a risk by combining the story of artistic pursuit with the colors and style of the 50s science fiction film. It's a risk with a wonderful payoff. Like any other Wes Anderson film, the set design is impeccable, and this time his frequent collaborator, Adam Stockhausen, has truly outdone himself. The town of Asteroid City, created entirely practically in the Spanish desert, is wonderful to look at during the film's runtime, and his dollhouse-like recreations of New York City theaters and fire escapes is also deserving of major praise. It's refreshing to see a world that the actors could actually interact with, instead of a giant green wall that will turn into computer-generated nonsense. Wes Anderson has fine-tuned his style into something that's much more complicated than the simple descriptions his attractors use to criticize. He's much more than characters standing blankly at the camera in a symmetrical frame than the AI videos attempt to depict. The camera moves constantly, and it's always calculated to the tiniest pan and dolly move. It's a testament to Robert Yalman as not only a brilliantly visual DP, but as a steel-handed camera operator. Anyone who's handled a camera knows it's not just luck that got Anderson's movies to look this good. It's the work of a composer-like filmmaker and something that should be praised and not simplified for empty criticism. Credit also needs to go to the ever-growing repertoire of actors Anderson employs. Yes, he uses the same actors regularly, but he uses them because they understand what is needed to create his vision. There are extremely complicated shots, where each actor needs to hit their mark perfectly in order for the shot to work. Gestures, lines, even eye movements have precise delivery. There is no room for improvisation. The film is a well-oiled machine. It's wonderful to see Jason Schwartzman back in a leading role in a Wes Anderson film. They've always worked well together through the years, and Schwartzman nails the deadpan delivery of Anderson's script. He is also able to carry a heavy emotional sadness behind his eyes, which is critical for this film. His role is a difficult one, playing a father who recently lost his wife and must now find a way to continue. Typical to Andy Anderson leading male, he makes decisions that are selfish, but we want to see him grow and do better. Like Royal Tenenbaum and Steve Zissou, there's a charm to Augie Steenbeck. We should hate him, but we see part of ourselves in him as well. Because of the layered script, we now get to examine with Anderson the motives of these sad and selfish leading men. And it's fascinating. 
For being such a packed cast, everyone gets their moment to shine, and almost everyone does. Many of the Anderson veterans continue to deliver. Newcomers to the Anderson world, Steve Carell, Tom Hanks, and Jeffrey Wright, all stood out and made their short screen times memorable. Missing this time around is Bill Murray, who became unavailable due to COVID issues. This is the first time he hasn't been in an Anderson film since Bottle Rocket, a span of 25 years. A special mention needs to go out to Margot Robbie, who appeared in only one single scene, a scene which almost moved me to tears, delivering a short monologue that reaches through every layer of the story and strikes at the beautiful, beating heart of this film. Asteroid City is a lovely time at the movies, where we can feel the wide range of emotions you want to feel when you sit in the theater, where we can admire the practical work of artists and filmmakers, and where we can be carried through a fascinating story by the sturdy hands of a group of talented actors. Thank you.